Thanks for, for joining us for the first all-Canadian edition of Tech Talks. Um, Corey is from Toronto as well. Uh, just to add to his bio, he's been a, a comic store clerk, uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, as you know, he's a best-selling science fiction novelist, a blogger, a journalist, and an activist. Uh, he has a new job with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So I guess um, before going into your backstory, let's, let's go with what's happening next. What's, what's taking you to California? Well, I mean, the, the initial impetus is that my wife's business is expanding. She runs a, a 3D printing toy company near here called Makey Lab, and most of their sales are in the U.S., and so mm -hmm. she's, she's moving to the U.S. to open their office. I'm being driven out of East London. Uh, you know, my office rent's doubled. My wife's office rent has doubled. Every building on our block has been torn down to build uh, luxury residences for offshore plutocrats who want to have safe deposit boxes in the sky. Again, this is all rationalization after we made the decision. Right. But the direction of travel seems like it's going in the right way. So right. Um, here we are doubling down on the evidence-free process of using standardized testing to, to build our education system around. We're doubling down on the evidence-free business of um, mass surveillance, policies that increase the wealth gap. You don't seem to be someone who moves somewhere to avoid a fight, so we'll get to the EFF right. in, a, in, in, in Well, a yeah, that's the other thing, is I wanted to wake up every morning apoplectic about the entertainment industry instead of the finance industry for a <laughs> decade. <so. laughs> um, but you are moving to California to join, uh, rejoin the same organization that that's initially good. brought you here. Tell, tell us about the role with the So yeah, Electronic Frontier Foundation, it's a nonprofit NGO. I started working for them in the early 2000s. I became their European director. I moved here to run their European operation, mostly working on standards and treaties in Brussels and in Geneva. When, the, when it got to the point where I was having to uh, kind of choose between getting my job done properly and writing, that I would, I would write full time. My boss was very understanding about it. She totally was, was on board with that. Uh, and then I spent 10 years writing novels that did very well and supported me and my family. And uh, after 10 years of this, I kind of turned around and looked at what was happening in the world of uh, technology and policy and thought that there are ways that in which it's getting extremely bad and very alarming. And when I started thinking about it, I started to think about ways that we could fix it. And I came up with a kind of grandiose plan to eliminate one of the worst technology policies, which is the law that prohibits um, removing digital locks or telling people how to remove di digital locks even from things they own, mm -hmm. uh, which has lots of implications for security because it means you can't tell people about flaws in devices they own because they could use those flaws to remove the digital locks. So we mm -hmm. end up with these long-lived reservoirs of digital pathogens and devices that are increasingly intimate with our lives. Uh, and I came up with a way to eliminate those policies all over the world in a decade. And I, I bounced it off EFF a couple of times last year and said, you guys should really think about doing this. And they kept saying, that sounds great, but we don't have anyone who could do that. We're all busy. Uh, and I took the hint, and I said, would you like me to come and do this? And they said, we would love you to come and do this. How will it help you to be based there? Oh, it just means I get to have dinner for a change instead of having to be on, the phone call, on a phone call every night at dinner time. And it means that I don't have to spend nearly quite so much time destroying the planet, crossing the stupid ocean. I mean, maybe we should go back a second and just explain sort of digital rights management and, and your sure. take on that. Right. What is your objection to DRM? You know, if you take a CD and you stick it in your computer's optical drive, it wakes up a piece of software supplied by the manufacturer whose original slogan was rip, mix, burn, and says, would you like to transcode this so you can take it with you on your mobile device? I'll even load it on your mobile device for you. Mm -hmm. If you put a DVD in, it won't. All it'll let you do with the DVD is watch it because the DVD has a digital lock on it. And although ripping a DVD and moving a DVD to a device is no more illegal or legal than doing this with the music on a CD, mm -hmm. breaking the lock is illegal. And so what you're expected to do with that DVD is buy the movie again for your mobile device. It's a kind of urinary tract infection business model, right? Instead of the value flowing in a healthy gush where you take a CD and then it turns into ringtones and alarm tones and streams and backups and soundtracks for YouTube videos and anything else you can think of, with, the, with, with things that start with a digital lock, everything has a price tag attached to it. Mm -hmm. It comes in a slow, burning, painful dribble. So that's the kind of consumer story. As a creator, the problem with allowing someone to put a digital lock on something that I made is that only they can authorize the removal of that lock. Hachette uh, uh, has always insisted on DRM. They're the most dogmatic of all the publishers. Last year, they were the first of the big five publishers to have their standard deal with Amazon expire. They do these 10-year deals. And Amazon wanted more from them. And they said no. And Amazon delisted all of their books 
from the Amazon store in the US that um, you, know, it, you couldn't buy J.K. Rowling. So I want to be in control of my destiny, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's grotesque that someone whose only contribution to my copyrighted work is to transcode it, mm -hmm. has more of a say in it than me who, who created it, or my publisher who invested in it, mm -hmm. right? I, of all the parties who have a legitimate claim to that copyright, it, it, it certainly isn't the company that processed it through a script uh, and then sold it. Industry and government, starting in the, in the mid-90s, started passing these laws that prohibit removing the locks and prohibit giving people information they could use to remove the locks. And that includes information about flaws in implementations of software. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really bad thing because we only have one experimental methodology for discovering security vulnerabilities, and that's disclosure. Your phone is not a destruction rectangle that you use to throw birds at pigs. It's a supercomputer in your pocket that knows who all your friends are and everything you've ever said to them and all the things they said to you and where you were when you were talking about it. It has a camera and a microphone and you take it into the toilet and into the bedroom and the only way you know if those things are off is by trusting the operating system. And so setting up structural impediments to disclosing vulnerabilities is an awful, terrible idea. And the idea that it's being done in the name of making sure that I get paid as an artist, I feel like gives me a, a special moral responsibility to reject it. You wrote recently in The Guardian about internet utopianism, mm -hmm. or utopians, and, and you referenced John Perry Barlow's 1996 Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, mm -hmm. um, which is basically you know, the rules of, of, of the physical world of, of industry don't apply there. Uh, and then you referenced how we sort of progressed into hustling sort of startup entrepreneurs to sort of techno monopolies that, that we sort of see today. Do we have any reason for optimism? I'm not a fan of optimism or pessimism. You know, I'm a, I'm a science fiction writer, and optimism and pessimism are both predictions about the future. Science fiction writers shouldn't make predictions about the future for the same reason drug dealers shouldn't sample their product, right? It never ends well. Hope is a much more interesting emotion to experience than optimism or pessimism. Hope is the condition in which you try even though you know that you may not get it. And the amazing thing about hope is if you have hope, it gives you strength. Mm -hmm. And so if your ship sunk and there was someone with you you loved who couldn't kick for themselves, you would kick for them. You'd put their arms around your neck and you'd kick for them until you couldn't kick anymore. Mm -hmm. And we are surrounded by people who don't yet understand the problems of technology, who can't kick for themselves. We, we have uh, not reached peak surveillance by any means, but we've certainly reached peak indifference to surveillance. You know, as the years go by, there will never be a time in which fewer people care about this stuff. And as we're waiting for those people, to figure out what's going on, to teach themselves to kick, we have a duty to bring them along with us, right? To hope for them as well. So hope is, is a thing that's worth doing because what's the alternative, right? Just don't get out of bed. And hope is a reason to get out of bed. I'm gonna miss you hugely and, and Alice um, and of course, Posey. So thank you so thank much you. for spending well, you your, your precious time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.